save you last week. So we can see. Right here is good. Yeah. Okay. Um. So what we're going to discuss tonight is actually the. It's not what it says. It's the English translation because really it's not the literal translation at all. But it is the verse Am Levadad Yishkon. Okay. Now this verse I found fascinating. Because it is a clear and direct machloket, a clear argument between two of the greatest Jewish leaders of the 20th century. And what's fascinating about it is that they are very, very connected to each other. And that is Rabbi Lord Dr. Jonathan Sachs and the Lubavitcher Rebbe. On this verse, they have completely opposite opinions. And we're going to go through them and we're going to go into trying to reconcile between their opinions and then say what we want to say practically for today. So, Rabbi Sachs has a story like this. He was once having Shavuot lunch in 2001 in Yerushalayim with a very famous staunch defender of the Jewish people, I believe he was not Jewish, whose name was Erwin Kotler. This man ended up becoming the Minister of Justice. Oh, he is Jewish. Oh, he speaks about him as if he, okay, fine. He is Jewish. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Yes, so he ended up becoming the Minister of Justice for the Canadians, which I don't know. I don't know what a Minister of Justice is. They don't have that in America, but I believe that means something like the Defense Minister, something like that. <laughs> Attorney General. Yes, Attorney General, that works for me. Okay, Attorney General. <laughs> so Erwin Cutler, they were sitting down by this meal, Shavuot lunch, and they were discussing the upcoming conference in Durban. There was a United Nations conference that was going to be a conference that was going to debate racism in the world and they knew that at the NGOs on the side debating at this conference it was going to end up bad for Israel and sure enough they ended up um, condemning Israel to the five cardinal sins of racism apartheid crimes against humanity and all those things and when they were having this lunch they were discussing you know what could we do they felt helpless this is what's going to happen they're going to sit down at the conference we know exactly what they're going to do so Erwin Cutler said a remark and he said I'm levadad yishkon a nation that's going to dwell alone. What can we do? And Rabbi Sachs said when he heard this, he became very upset. It finally clicked for him. And he said that we cannot condemn ourselves. We cannot say it's going to be a lonely nation. If that's our faith, we cannot believe in this. And what did he argue? He based his argument on three things. Number one, he said, if you look in the Torah, you will see that loneliness is always said to us to be bad. The first time in the Torah it says the term not good, is when it speaks about Adam. It says Adam was alone, and it is not good to be alone. The next time in the Torah it speaks about being not good is when Yisro, Moshe's father-in-law, comes and he sees him sitting alone and judging the Jewish people. He says, Moshe, that's not good. You can't do that. you got to have multiple judges. You can't just stand in front of the people all by yourself. It's not good to be alone. Then we see what's the punishment for leprosy. The ultimate punishment is we make them be alone. We send them mechutz l'machana. They have to sit outside the camp. They have to be alone. And then we see in the Book of Lamentations, the Book of Eicha that we read on Tisha B'av, it says about Yerushalayim that the city was alone, there was nobody in the streets, and clearly we see the connotation in the Torah is that being alone is not good. The second point of his argument is that he says, look at who's the one who says the prophecy. Where does the prophecy come from? It's Bilam. This is not a guy who loves the Jewish people. It says in the Talmud, I believe it's Shaktate Shabbat, where it speaks about how every single one of the blessings that Bilam gives the Jewish people actually ends up turning into a curse, except one, about uh, dwelling in tents and Yaakov and everything. But every single blessing that he gave the Jewish people ended up turning into a curse, which means Am Levadad Yishkon is not a blessing, it's a curse. And not only that, we know that Bilam had such bad intentions, it wasn't just that he tried to curse the Jewish people and he couldn't and he gave up. He ended up devising a scheme with the Midianite women and coercing and seducing the Jewish men. And what ended up happening was 24,000 Jews died because of Bilam. So Rabbi Sack says, if it came from Bilam, such an evil man, obviously there's no way it can be a good thing. It's not a good thing. And the third point of his argument is that if you look in the Torah, it says never that it is good the fate of the Jewish people to be alone. In fact, it says the opposite. We see two prophecies, if I'm not mistaken, by Zechariah and by Yeshayo where he says that in the future, what is going to happen? There is going to be the Messiah. They both say it in different ways. There's going to be the Mashiach. 
all the nations of the world are going to know and they're going to thirst for the Torah and they're going to come to the Jewish people and they're going to say, please teach us the Torah and show us the ways of the God and everything. And we see that the prophecy is that all the nations will become with us, not separate from us. So we are not going to be alone. So what does Rabbi Sachs conclude from this? Is that we must realize we cannot condemn ourselves. We are not destined to be alone. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the Jewish people say that they're going to be alone, that we're going to be alone, we'll have no chance. But if we believe in not being alone, then we will be successful. Now over here, we are going to go into the story with the Rebbe. We're going to try to reconcile between them. In 1972, Yehuda Avner, who was the advisor to, the prime, not the prime minister, excuse me, at the time he was a representative in the United Nations, to Yitzhak Rabin. He told him that the president of Israel at the time was Zalman Shazar. Zalman Shazar, I don't know if a lot of people know, but Zalman Shazar's origins is a Chabad Chassid, a Lubavitch Chassid. So Zalman Shazar, it, took, it gave him great pleasure whenever Israeli diplomats would visit the Lubavitch Rebbe. It got him very excited. He loved it. And they have many different stories with Zalman Shazar. So Yehuda Avner came to Yitzhak Rabin and said, you know, President Shazar would really appreciate if you would go and visit the Lubavitch Rebbe. And he said right away in this story, is on video directly from Yehuda Avner and Yitzhak Rabin. Both of them say the story directly. This is straight from them. Yehuda Avner said right away, Yitzhak Rabin looked at him and he said, Azovoti, multiple times, because Yehuda Avner knew how to connect with the prime ministers and get them to do what he wanted them to do. And he went in and Yitzhak Rabin said, Azovoti, I'm not interested. I don't know this rabbi. I'm not doing, I'm not doing this. Finally, he agrees. And he says, I'll go. But he's not going at some sugar an hour in the middle of the night because he knew that the rabbi was famous, that during the day, he was busy answering letters, meeting, and then at night, he would meet with people till all hours of the night. So he said, I'm not going at any crazy hour of the night. You have to book me a normal appointment. And that's what they do. He says, 4 p.m. And he says, also, another condition, I don't want any press. No media, no press. Sure enough, he shows up to 770 Eastern Parkway, Brooklyn, New York. 4 p.m. There's press all over the place taking pictures. He looks at your and he says, I don't know, who, I don't know what. That Whatever, you can't control those things. And he goes in. And Yitzhak Rabin says, he describes his immediate first impressions. First of all, he noticed the room. That the room in 770, the office, was unlike any office he ever went in of somebody of a prestigious nature. It was just covered in old, tattered books. The entire office, it's actually still left in the same condition today. They just put glass over it. You could see there's nothing special looking about it. And he was very, he looked around, he was expecting some sort of grandeur or some sort of nothing. An old wooden shelves with books. Then he noticed, he describes this himself, and he's a, meaning I haven't heard many speeches from him, but this, the way he spoke, he's a fantastic speaker. And he says he noticed the Rebbe's eyes right away. And he speaks about it for a long time. People always spoke about it, but it's unique. They said how the eyes, they were piercing and intense and sensitive. And right away they go, and Yehuda Avner is sitting there, and he's thinking, okay, they'll probably have one of these political, you know, oh, uh, happy birthday. It was the Rebbe's birthday. Actually, I forgot. So, and also he bumped into, in the waiting room, Herman Walk was sitting there, the author. And he was bringing happy birthday from the president. And it was the Rebbe's 72nd birthday. And he thought it was going to be one of those happy birthday, you know, from the president. You know, how are you? You know, shalom. And that's it. Peace. Right away, the Rebbe starts off the conversation and he asks Rabin. He says, how does it feel to be in a room with 120 nations? Do you feel alone in the UN? And Yehuda Avner who is a very, I've ever saw him speak, he's a fantastic, uh, very animated speaker. He said he almost fell off his chair because he knew his whole job is to be the master of politics and to know everyone's opinion and how to talk to every person, everything. And Yitzhak Rabin's foundational opinion of secular Zionism is that Israel as a state would be able to make the Jewish people no longer alone because once we would have our own state, then we would become a people like all the other people. So he knew that probably the worst thing to ask Yitzhak Rabin is, do you feel alone? So he asked this question to Rabin. And Rabin took it in stride and he said, he said, he, you know, he, said, he said, no. So the Rabbi said to him, I want to tell you something. That you should know that when it comes to this idea of Amda Badad Yishkon, a nation which lives alone, it is a divinely decreed reality. And it is always going to be this way. And then the Rabbi told him from both sides, a double-edged sword. On the positive side, the Jewish people are too strong and too stubborn and have stuck to their guns 
for 2,000 years with no state. One of the most miraculous survivals in the history of the world. The most miraculous. If you want to just see a miracle, just look at the Jewish people. To go through pogroms and holocausts and expulsions and crusades and to be able to come out as a surviving nation, that shows you the pure strength and power of the Jewish people. So on the one hand, you have the positive, And on the other hand, you have the negative, that there's been constant oppression. So this, the Rebbe says, is a fact. It is a divinely decreed by God. This is always going to be. Then the Rebbe moved the topic over to the idea of Eza who is a who is praiseworthy, is somebody who is misamech the chalko, somebody who's happy with his lot, somebody who's happy with what he has. Now, to me, it's not as I've never seen a clear written argument the same way I saw from Rabbi Lord Dr. Jonathan Sachs. So I didn't, I don't see it, I only know it from the story, but I would say what I would imagine the Rebbe's point was is that yes, we are a nation that is alone. But that itself is a paradox. There's no such thing as a lonely nation. What does it mean to be a lonely nation? That's not a thing. If a person has a nation, he has a strong nation. If he's misamech, well, go. if he has happy with what he has, then he's not lonely because he has everything that he needs. Especially today with social media, which this we see like crazy, crazy our generation. I don't even know the names, Gen Z, millennials, whatever you want to call them. Maybe it's two different generations. That people are going on social media they get thousands of followers, 10,000 followers, 20,000 followers. And I don't know if you guys know about this, but amongst kids, this is a huge thing. Kids want to have, I have 10,000 likes, I have 400 likes, whatever it is. This means a lot to children. Maybe to the older generations, it seems like funny business. Why do I need 400 people to like my thing? I don't care. I don't know 400 people. I only need uh, my 40 people I know in my neighborhood. To the younger generation, this has become a huge problem. And actually, there is a documentary called The Social Dilemma, which they show how this has become a tremendous source of depression because people have started to look around the world for external and shallow validation. And they say, you know what? My relationship with my family, it's not great. My relationship with my parents, it's not great. My relationship, if they're ever thinking of getting married or a spouse or anything like that, who knows? It's that I'll get validation by getting likes and followers on these platforms for making videos that get your attention very quickly for nine seconds. So this idea of needing validation, we need the other nations, we need to be with the other nations. I'll tell you myself, especially since moving to Israel, is that when you're living in Israel in our society, you don't feel alone if you're not like the other nations. You're saying about uh, Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving, all these things. Thanksgiving actually is something I celebrated a lot as a kid. We always, every year Thanksgiving was huge. And it was a very, uh, we loved the holiday. But the idea of being alone as a nation, you do not feel alone if you are together with your people. And there is no such thing as a lonely nation. And one more idea on this is that you see in general when it comes to happiness, of people feeling truly happy, it goes with different ladders. There's a hierarchy. If your essential relationships are not good, your external relationships make no difference, which means, let's say as an adult, if your marriage is not a good marriage, all the other relationships you have after that are going to be more difficult. It's going to be hard to come home every day to a spouse that doesn't like you, they don't have a good relationship with. If you have a good marriage, then step two is have a good relationship with your kids, with your siblings, with your parents, wherever it is. And then subsequently your community. Once you have those relationships locked up, chances are if you have good relationships in those areas, you'll be a happy person. If you don't, there's an amazing idea that speaks about the Ben Sora or Mora, that it says, it discusses, we were talking about how is it possible in the Torah that we give up on a child and we condemn them and we have to kill them and all these different things. Now, what happens to the Ben Sora and Mora? Why is it that the child becomes so rebellious and he goes off the path and he can't be saved and all these different things? Is because his parents gave up on him. One of the conditions to be a Ben Sora and Mora is that the parents bring their child to the Beit Din. Once the parent says, I give up on this child, the reason why his punishment has to be so severe is because the Beit Din says if his parents give up on the child, now he has no chance. As long as he has those essential relationships, he always has a chance. So let's speak about a little bit, instead of the argument, a technical answer I thought about to myself of this machloket between them is that they're not arguing. If you look at Rabbi Sachs's argument and the Rebbe's answer is that they both agree that when it comes to the future, when it comes to the final redemption, God willing, speedily in our days, the prediction is that the entire world is going to realize the unity of God. The entire world is going to the whole world is going to know God the same way the ocean covers the, the sand in the ocean. Okay? So we know that this is going to be a reality of Mashiach comes. 
And there's a beautiful, beautiful story that I heard that happened recently, a few years ago. There's a family called the Rosen family from Miami. This family had a baby boy. The parents did not know what to name the baby boy. And the story happened as simply as I'm telling it to you, which means there's no like other side. This is the story is as simple as this, as basic and simple as this. They didn't know what to name the baby. They were debating between each other, arguing what's going to be the baby's name. This and that. They had no one. There wasn't anyone specific that passed away that was obvious in the family. They didn't have any name that they liked very much. So the wife calls up her father and the father says, you should know that parents have a special intuition when it comes to the time of naming a son and that you should trust whatever you look at the baby, the day of the Brit Milan, you say, oh, this is going to be the baby's name. That's the baby's name. And if you don't understand why, that's the name. Fine. But he says, you should know, like every good parent says, you know, it's up to you and it's your decision, but you should know if you're looking for suggestions. There is a grandfather in the family whose name was David Chai, and he was a very special holy man. If you don't have a name, that would probably be a good name to pick. Okay, fine. Comes to the day of the bris. The father goes to name the baby. One name comes out, Netanel Yaakov. The bris is on Sunday. Okay, so they're both like, okay, Netanel Yaakov, that's what happened. That's the intuition, Netanel Yaakov, beautiful. They get a call. The mother-in-law gets a call after the brit milah from a woman in Savannah, Georgia. And she says, wow, your children are such sadikim, such righteous people, so beautiful that they named after the couple, uh, excuse me, after the father and son that were killed in the terrorist attack. She says, what are you talking about? She says, there's a terrorist attack. And of course, and they named the baby after the father and son. She's like, she thinks she's joking. She's like, obviously, you know that they named the baby. And she looks. And sure enough, they see on Friday afternoon, very soon before Shabbat, the couple had no idea. You can imagine when a baby's born. I'm sure everyone remembers. The baby's born. It's total craziness. The parents' heads are all over the place. They didn't see the news. And they just named the baby Natalia Yaakov off the cuff. There was a family, a full family driving in a van. And a terrorist open fired on them. The mother says the story where she says she's sitting in the car. They hear the firing. The car goes flying off into a ditch. And she starts calling out her whole family's name. Her husband, Netanel, did not answer. He was killed. And her son, Yaakov. Both of them died in the attack. And they named their baby after this, after this, after uh, these two people. And it's unbelievable you see the connection of the Jewish people. And you think, wow, that's an amazing story. But it goes one step further. Later on, that Shabbat, that week after the Brit Milah, the wife was reading an article in Ami magazine about the attack. Ami magazine is a big American, uh, I don't know what, orthodox magazine. It's very nice. And her husband comes home from Shul, and she greets him so excited. He's like, wow, this is the best. I never got such an excited. This is amazing. Such a greeting coming up from Shul. Wow. He's like, what happened? She says, you're not going to believe this. The boy and the father, their names were the father's name was Netanel David, and the son's name was Yaakov Chai, which the second name of their names was David and Chai, the name that was offered to them that they should have named, or the, that the father suggested to them. So you see the incredible connection and relationship between Am Yisrael and Jew Jewish people. And to end off with one more story to finish. Another Rebbe story. Someone once came to the Rebbe, after the Holocaust, he survived the Holocaust, and he had every single member of his family was killed. Meaning not like a sister, every single member of his family did not survive the Holocaust. So he came to the Rebbe, and he tells the Rebbe about, you know, this is, this is what it is. He said, my whole family died, and I decided I'm not going to bring any life into this evil world. I'm going to continue living on my life. I'm not going to take my life. I know it's against the Torah. I'm not going to do that, but I'm not bringing any life into this evil world. And the Rebbe started crying with him. And they both just had a moment of just crying, just alone in this room, just crying together. And the Rebbe said to him, what survived the Holocaust? And he told him, he said, no one. And the Rebbe said, no. The Rebbe said, there's one thing that survived the Holocaust that the Nazis didn't take from. And what is that? That's love. You still have the ability to love. Why do you not want to bring your children into this world? Because you love them. And you love them so much, you don't want them to live in such an evil world. So what do you still have? What's the only thing the Nazis could not take from any of us? Is love. So not only should you have children, you should get married. You should have many, 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 many children. And in addition to that, you should always love all children. Every child you see, you should greet with a smile, greet with a hug. As much that's accepted today in the 21st century, 
and to love every single child. And sure enough, this man became known in his shul. He was the big, happy, smiley guy. Even into his older years, which is generally known, not everyone loves kids running around shul. This guy always was a staunch defendant of the children, running at the kiddush first and destroying the whole kiddush and taking all the food and making all the noise. He loved it. And he had many children from this. And the one idea we can take out of all of this, and the main point of this entire discussion, is that Am Levadad Yishkon, to be the lonely nation, there is no such thing as the lonely nation. Yes, to be clear, of course it is very important, and it speaks about it in halacha, the idea of peace with the kings and peace with the rulers and peace with the world. It's important to have a relationship with the outside world. I'm not saying at all we should be hermits and move into our little huts and say we're separate from the world. But we should realize that if the world is hating us for no reason, our focus and number one needs to be our people. Yes, we will stand for our values. We're never going, like for example, with Israel and the United States. We will always stand by our values. Of course, the United States is a very valuable ally. Of course, we know we need their missiles and rockets and Apache helicopters, whatever it is. I don't know exactly the, the technicalities that we need in this relationship. But we do not bend our values to them. So yes, we can have relationships and should have relationships with the Goyim and the outside world and the people of the world, but it is essential and the most important that we realize that when we have each other, we are never alone. Laila Tov. Oh, questions? Yes, uh, questions. I know, let me just set up the coding.